Father in prayer. I want to pray for a couple people. Father in heaven, we come before you and just pray for Joe today. He's sick. He means so much to us, this congregation, and just uh, please bless him and heal him, Father. We pray for Patty, too. Patty Huffman, her dad and mom are sick. She's a nurse on the front lines, and she's got a lot of burden, Father. We just pray that you'll help her, and through this, thank you for her service to, to people, Father, as she continues to serve. We pray for Rick Russell, Father. He continues to fight cancer, and just please take this away completely, Father, and help him to feel better, Father. Thank you that he's here this morning, though, just still loving you and wanting to be closer to you. We pray for our president and his staff and his wife, Father, to have a COVID now. We pray for your healing hand upon them, Father, and strengthen them, Father, and help them, God, through this. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Father, my lesson this morning is growing in brotherly kindness. Can it be said of you that he is the kindest person I know, or is she is the kindest person I know? Goth, the German poet, said, Kindness is the golden chain by which society is bound. Last time in 2 Peter chapter 1, we were looking at godliness, which is the devout reverence there toward God, giving God his due. And in 2 Peter, uh, we see that we're to add to godliness brotherly kindness. And so let's take a look at 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 7 here, just a little review. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your... Face supply moral excellence in your moral excellence knowledge, in your knowledge self-control, in your self-control perseverance, in your perseverance godliness, and in your godliness brotherly kindness, in your brotherly kindness love. And so we we see here. Then you notice that basically he's talking about this promise that that we have as Christians, and it's, it's basically we have this divine power from God, and that He is giving us that. And then He says. For that reason, I want you to apply this diligence, and I want you to add these things to your faith. We've been adding these different graces in the previous lessons to help us to see our Christian character here to excel and to increase, like Jesus, basically. Jesus, remember, increased in wisdom and stature in favor with, with God and man. He got along with most people, didn't he? He even ate with sinners and tax gatherers, and the Pharisees even asked him to come and eat with him at, at, at their house. But he did rebuke them quite sharply at times when they became a law unto themselves. And, uh, and so uh, you know, he, would, he would do that, wouldn't he? And talk to them about the taxes and stuff. The taxes are important. He, they tried to kind of jab him. But remember Proverbs 27, verse 5, I think, in this lesson, too. It says, in this lesson, better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. So as we look at this uh, lesson this morning, those first two words, brotherly kindness, and break that down a little bit, Brotherly is from the Greek word eldelphos. There refers to a fellow believer or fellow member of a single family. It's used up 248 times in the New Testament and 91 times to brothers in the flesh. Brotherly kindness is translated there from Philadelphia or Philadelphos. Okay, so basically this idea of being uh, the, means the love of one's brother, fondness of brethren. Sometimes it's used with this very personal application. And sometimes it's just a general reference to the whole brotherhood across, our brothers, our brotherhood. Kindness is that familiar English word there. Webster uses it as kind indeed or a kind deed or an affection. But in Christ Jesus, we know we have a family of, of brothers. I think there's some just general admonitions first I'd like to share, but we are to add this kindness to your godliness. Tender affections, friendly love of the brethren in our family of believers. I think this grace is part of the supreme grace, which is, which is love. Kindness is, is part of uh, love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, it talks about love is kind. Love is patient, and not jealous, does not brag, it's not arrogant. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32 says, We're to put off the old man of sin, which is you know, a lot of times bitterness, anger, uh, clamor, uh, along with malice, and put on Christ. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, Forgiving each other just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. When one loves his brother, he seeks to do him good, not to do him harm. I think of uh, uh, the late uh, Ruth Ginsburg, who uh, became a great friend with Antonio Scalia on the Supreme Court. And uh, they had extreme points of differences on the Supreme Court, and yet they were, became very close friends. And they both, both became very effective in their own positions. And, and, she, and, and Ruth said that it was because of his kindness and his gentleness toward me, even though they were very strong, you know, uh, combatants, really, in, on the Supreme Court. 
And she said, well, he used to attack the ideas, but he would never attack me. And so personally, and so I think there's something to be learned from that. From what we see is, as the scripture says, if you want to convert people, you convert them in the spirit of gentleness. Colossians 3, verse 12 through 14, and so then those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on this heart of compassion, kindness, humility, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so also should you. Notice again, the motivation is that we have Christ and we're looking to him as our example, and he forgave us, and so we are to forgive others and have that same kind of of act, expression toward others. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 8, 9 sums up then, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, humble in spirit, kind-hearted, humble in, in uh, spirit, not returning evil for evil uh, or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for this very purpose that you might be inherit a blessing, in other words. And so, you know, that, that billboard that said, you know, spread, spread kindness instead of a virus, you know. Uh, be understanding in this pandemic because you know, we've been doing that here. We've been working through that here at Westside, I mean, being considerate of one another and trying to help each other, you know, our elderly people, and, and, and being concerned about everybody. That's important. And in our political debates we see across the country, they could take some advice here, couldn't they, in this, as far as you know, the way that uh, such, if somebody you know, throws out uh, things uh, at one another, Christians are to act according to the teachings of Jesus here, regardless of how others act. They are not to do unto others as, as they do unto them. Such as if they would call someone a clown, or then you call, come back and say, well, you idiot, or something like that, you know? Discuss the ideas, but move on. You don't have to attack the person. Rather, we are to return what he says, a blessing, and do not return evil for evil, but respect your opponent. Jesus taught, I think, this principle in Matthew chapter 5, verse uh, 44 and uh, 45. He says, you have heard of all, you know, to hate your enemies. But I say unto you, love your enemies and do good to them. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. So consider these reasons then this morning for growing in kindness. I think when we look at John uh, chapter 15, he talks about this, uh, where uh, it talks about this love concept. Let's take a look at John chapter 15. John 15, I believe, verse 12. He says, This is the commandment you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends if you do what I command you. So you notice how he's showing us that this is this, this great love this is what Jesus did. He laid down his life for us. And watch this. Is, if you are my friends, if you do what I command you, this friendship with Jesus is tied in to doing his will. Now, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, John 15, 14. Unity with him, then, is this closest friendship that he is seeking for us. It's the oldest unchanged law. When we go over to 1 John chapter uh, 3 and uh, chapter 2 here, I think we can see some of this. Let's take a look at 1 John chapter 3. Actually, if you get with verse 2, is chapter 2 also. So we'll kind of bounce in and out of John today. Okay, 1 John chapter 2. He says, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and, and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And so, you see, but this is the message he says we have heard from the beginning. And then you look over in chapter 3, verse 11, he goes back to Cain here and he says, but this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, all the way back to Genesis there, that you should love one another, not as Cain, who... Uh, was of the evil one and slew his brother. For what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not marvel, brethren, if the world hates you. We have, we have, we know that hey, we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren, and he who does not love abides in death. And so 
That is the message, isn't it, that we see here. Abel obeyed God. And Cain was jealous, and he killed him. And so John is going back there and showing us that that was a requirement in the very beginning of creation. Be kind then to your brother. And uh, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sin. So if we play with sin like Cain, where we get angry and bitter, and then it leads to that murder, then we cross the line. We miss the mark. That's what he did. He killed him. If we enjoy that, it blessed conceives again and again. What happens? We, we're separated from God. We're separating ourselves from God. And so we see that, don't we, in our country today, where we see these protests, and it becomes rock-throwing, it becomes cursing, it becomes anger, spitting on people. Then people walk up to police officer cars, and they shoot them when they're just sit, sitting there. That is sinful. It is wrong. It's murder. And so you've gone too far, haven't you? And so it gets back to how important isn't the Word of God in our hearts is that we need to look at the Word of God, don't we, and let it dwell in there before those things bloom into things that we never intended for them in the first place. You just stepped on Satan's side if you're in that, in that ring. The personal application and brotherly kindness is special. We miss our potlucks, don't we, here? And we hope we can have some maybe next, next month. Because we know that fellowship is important for us to, to exchange. But we can certainly have some of that in social distancing. But also this kindness will keep you from stumbling. You notice in 1 John chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, it talks about that. If anyone who says he's in the light and yet hates his brother, uh, he is in darkness until now. But the one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him when we show that kindness. And, second, and, third, and fourthly, it will prove you to be a child of God. You will be born again. In chapter 3, verse 10 there, of 1 John, he says that we are born again. We've been born of God, verse 9, practice, and no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, children of God and children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. And so we see then that uh, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. He's not living a habitual sinful life. Occasionally we know we sin and we need cleansed. And 1 John deals with that, doesn't it? If we confess our sin to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. But here in this context, he's talking about the guy who's continuing to sin and he doesn't repent. And he does it over and over again. But we know as Christians, 1 Peter says that we've been born again, not of, of perishable seed, but, but that, um, that non-perishable, that we have eternal life. So by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. And I look back to Abraham. Remember when Abraham called God, he said, I know that Abraham is going to be a good father. He's going to go teach his children and, and love them and keep teaching them and teach them righteousness. And then... God leaves him, and he goes down to Sodom, and, and Abraham asks him, he says, Listen, God, uh, what about Sodom? Will you, will you spare Sodom if there's 50 righteous people? 40? 30? God said, yes. 20? Yes. 10? Yes. Well, what happened next? He looked upon Sodom, and there wasn't too many, and he said, You guys get out of town. His lot and his wife took off, and those just few that were there. And he destroyed that city, didn't he? Because of immorality and, and, and sexual sin. He wanted, he loved them, but they continued to practice that, not repenting of their sins. And so Lot became that pillar of salt because she didn't, she looked back when God told her not to look back. God hates sin that is continually practiced. There's no more sacrifice for sin. And so the influence of sin is powerful, isn't it? Second Peter had an interesting thing in her Bible class there. It talks about. Lot being their righteous Lot was among them, and he had this influence around him, and it was tormenting his soul, okay? The, so the power of sin in your environment is important, isn't it? Because it can torment your soul, and he need to get out of there. And so if there's something like that in your life, and you're in the wrong group, you need to get away, don't you? You need to get away, because bad company corrupts good morals. Fifth, though, it's also a source of security and certainty. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 here, it talks about uh, because we are walking in the light, we know we've passed out of death into this life, he says, uh, because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. So again, 
we see because we love, there, he, he who does not love abides in this death. Everyone hates his brother is a murderer. And so, and you know, no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. It's uh, verse 16 there, uh, again, deals with this. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for the us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So if we see people with needing worldly goods, or we have our children homes food drive this year, and we have many of those kids need food, don't they? We are giving. We want to share it because we know that they're, they're uh, young people who are uh, in families that come from pretty rough backgrounds, and they need food. So we want to help where we can. And so this abiding in Him is important. It's a way to get on the right road to giving your lives to your brothers as Jesus gave His life to us. Showing that by giving food and clothing is, is important. And so when we help each other and give, care for each other, we realize that we're acting like Christ. Verse 19, I think, has a good, good result there, too. If you look down a little ways, he says, you know, do it in deed and truth. And it does a couple of things. One is, you notice he said in verse 19, we shall know by this we are of the truth. We're walking in the truth. People sometimes can't figure out what the truth is today. Look in the Word of God. You're doing these things. You're walking in the truth. And secondly, he says, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things and shall assure our heart before him. When we go before the judgment, we're going to have confidence. We're going to have uh, this conscience that it's going to be clean, and we're going to be glad to be there because we know we've been walking in God, and we've asked forgiveness, and we've, we've been there, and so we're not going to be guilty. We're not going to, oh, man, what am I going to do, you know? And so we're going to walk in the truth, and he will give us that conscience, and we'll be confident in the judgment. Have you ever been to the traffic court? You know, you might have went over, over the, you know, the amount, and, and you get to the judge, you know, and, and you're, you're pleading mercy and grace, you know? You realize you 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 uh, you know broke the law, and you're getting they're there basically just to get a hundred dollars off on your ticket or whatever, you know. But the judgment's coming, isn't it? And, and we want, but we we go to the court. We may be guilty. Okay, how are we going to go when we go before God? Well, we're going to be as Christians cleansed, and we're going to be free because we've been walking in His life. And so to know Him, another reason is to know God and have Him dwelling in us. In First John chapter four. Verse 17, or 7 there, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Verse 8, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So to know God and, and Him dwelling in us is, a, is another important reason for growing in kindness. We show who we belong to, and as God sent Jesus into the world to die for our sins. We can know, we, we can show the world we are of Him by talking about the love of God. For the Bible says, you know, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting love, everlasting life. So love is stronger than hate. I think every act of obedience it must come out of love. First Corinthians chapter 13 talks about this. It says, you know, you can give your body to be burned, but if you don't have love, it profits you nothing. You can give all your food to somebody, but if you don't have love, it profits you nothing. It's useless. So the reason we do our mission work is what? Is because we have this love for God. And the result of one becoming a Christian is that we will love. And in the context here of 1 John, another reason for Christians is that we, for this love is that because God is love. And it's His very nature. God is spirit. He is light. Hebrews says he's a consuming fire, but God is love means more than God is a loving God. He is in He is all in all that He does. Loving others, then, is, is this nearest approach that men can come to being like God. It's about love, isn't it? That's the supreme one that we'll look at next week. But when one when one loves a brother, he will seek to do him good and never do him harm. And in our congregation, I see nurses here, uh, past and present, caregivers people who make things for others in hospitals. That is a constant care of being like God in a service to the sick and laying their lives down and helping people that are hurting and they're making them feel better. That's a blessing to them. You are walking in the light when you do that. They put their lives in danger as they're exposed to these viruses and these diseases. Patty and other nurses that are still there, you know, they're working through that. They're precious. They're doing the work of Jesus. Carolyn, many years, doing it. Alvin appreciated them over at the rehab, even though I gave him some, 
hard time in this front door. <laughs> but, you know, we see the principle here is unless Christians love their brothers, they cannot know God. What is the result of knowing God and being like Him? The community notices. They notice, don't they? They notice, boy, that person sure is always happy in the Lord. And so they have that. But also, I think, finally, I think there's a character and a manifestation then of being, uh, having this brotherly kindness. I think one thing is hospitality. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9 and 10 uh, deal with this. Let's take a look at that. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9 and 10 talking about hospitality to one be hospitable to another without complaint as each one has received a special gift employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God so be hospitable without complaint being willing to do it not not complaining the word here means loving strangers or being kind to strangers in the first century remember there were preachers and evangelists going about being persecuted, they were traveling, they needed a place to stay, and Christians say, come on in, you know, we'd love to have you. Christians do not all have the same gift, do they? So some people have that gift of more hospitality. Whatever you have, use it for the benefit of others, he says there in verse 10, that have that special gift, as each one has that special gift, that gift of hospitality maybe. And so uh, persecution, remember, is happening all over our world today that we're talking about in Bible class. And over in Belarus right now uh, is they're persecuting Christians, throwing them in jail, and threatening to take their children away, according to the article I was reading in the Christian Chronicle this week. Sometimes when you have that hospitality, it's important to be there, isn't it, for people who are being persecuted as Christians. Hospitality sometimes is inconvenient and harder to make work. But as Christians, we don't want to be discontent in that decision, but willing and cheerful to do it. You may uh, be harmed for helping somebody, but that's what happens, isn't it? You may, as some in India and other places, you know, where the government comes in and they, they get kind of rough about it. But that's important, isn't it? Uh, a manifestation of that kindness. Another one is fellowship. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And we're, we're trying to get back on our, with our life group here this month, and we want to, because we want to get uh, into the Word with one another and pray together and have this fellowship that's so important for us. Uh, sincerity. In Romans chapter 12, verse 9, it talks about this sincerity. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Again, talking about the sincerity and what, how we can do it, how we can apply some of these, these principles that Jesus is uh, talking about in, in Paul. He says in 9, Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. So let love be without hypocrisy. We must be genuine. We must hate evil. Cling to what is good. You know, shooting police officers is the face. In the face is evil. Okay? We hate that. That's what he's saying. Is he's saying, you, you are too hated, he said, abhor what is evil. You have to call a, a, a spade a spade, right? That's basically what he's saying there. And But also, at the same time, what does he say? He says, cling to what is good. Okay? Uh, so, uh, that next verse, and then be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another. We prefer one another. We believe in the same doctrine about salvation. We understand what the God has named his church. We know that the church is called by many things in scripture, but we don't call it the New Bill Church, do we, or the, the Carpenter Church. We call it the Church of Christ, and we give, give Bible names. We want to be identified with who? The head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. He is the Son of God. We recognize that. That's what makes us a brotherhood that is close, that is, that is identifiable with God and, and with Jesus as we, as we read together. So we know that as, as Christians, we, we, uh, we are honoring one another, and that's a good thing. Give others honor by regarding them more important than yourselves. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. I think we can be free then in giving our praises to others. A lot of trouble sometimes arises in churches when they're concerned with privileges and places and prestige. But people want their rights, but they should be concerned more, I think, about duties and how they can serve in leadership and how they can evangelize and how they can, you know, how long has it been since you told your story to your neighbor or to somebody else, you know, instead of worrying about these things that the government's doing. Where have you been there in, in your life? 
And so the love of the brethren will motivate Christians to give honor to others and not seek it for themselves. There's many others that we're not going to go through today, but sympathy, forgiveness, impartiality, and fervor. We must constantly increase our, and we know that if you do a good deed, you help someone out, you give them a place at your table, you share a cup of coffee, you, you get to know them better, and the teachers here are such a blessing to Westside. I really appreciate every one of you that are teaching. Thank you for using your talent and your faith and just your love for the brethren here. The, the participation is, is fantastic. And, you know, in all of these, we see that there's no limit, is there, on these graces. We see that, you know, well, you had enough patience. Now. I guess you can stop. No, you've got enough faith. No. You've got to continue on. No, you have to increase this. And, and even when you get older, you have to continue, don't you, to, to work at these things. So as we close this morning, consider these reasons for growing in kindness. Are, are your dearest friends in the church, do you really feel your brother and sisters are the finest people in the world? He calls us salt. He calls us light. We're the sheep of the great shepherd, the one who is leading us to heaven. And keep these manifestations of brotherly kindness open in your walk. Are you hospitable? Are you looking for fellowship daily? You know, there's a genuine, have a genuine search for your gift, asking God to direct you in that gift to serve people here at Westside and other places in your community. Thank you this morning for those who set up, clean the building, people that are meeting and greeting people at the door. It shows that you care. It shows that you're part of the body and that we, we are working one with another. Peter and Paul here both say we are to increase these things with no limit. We are to practice them. And when we do, he says, it will cause you to neither stumble and that your, and your salvation will be secure. I love First uh, Thessalonians talking about my, my, like, as I'll end with this, this verse. Now may God our Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that you may establish your hearts without blame in the holiness before God and the Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen, brother? Amen. Amen. You need the prayers this morning, the, the body this morning. You need to confess your sins. Maybe there's something that you are practicing in a, in a habitual way. That can be very dangerous, and uh, you just haven't shared with someone. Is there something in your life that is destroying your brotherly kindness? If so, come, let it be known. We'll pray for you this morning.